Alrighty, good afternoon everybody. This session is called Everything You Wanted to Know About ODBC But Were Afraid to Ask. Um, one thing I should point out is that, um, a couple of things. One is that I only have 75 minutes and this is a big topic. So the white paper has a lot more information um, than I can possibly present. There are some topics that I'm not gonna cover at all, but they are covered in detail in the white paper. Um, the other thing is that we are gonna do a, a, a pretty deep dive on a lot of these things, a lot of the functions. So even if you've been working with ODBC for a while, um, hopefully you'll find some stuff maybe that you didn't know before or didn't hadn't used a lot. Anyway, just to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Doug Hennig. I'm a partner with Stonefield Software. Um, I've written a number of tools over the years, including Stonefield Query and Stonefield Database Toolkit, uh, which by the way is now open source, SDT that is. Um, I've written a number of tools that come with Visual Fox Pro uh, and with Sedna, written a, quite a few articles over the years, uh, written a number of books over the years. Um, as you know, I'm a, one of the organizers of Southwest Fox and Virtual Fox Fest. I'm also one of the administrators of VFPX. I was a Microsoft MVP for 15 years, and in 2006, I was given the Fox Pro Community Lifetime Achievement Award. So, um, before ODBC came along, if you were working with um, a database engine of some kind, uh, for example, I worked a lot with Btrieve back in the day, um, you had to typically use uh, a DLL, uh, an API, and it was very often a, a C-based API. So it was usually fairly difficult to work with. You had to you know, make sure the function calls were correct. Every database had a different set of function, function names, function parameters, and so on. Then ODBC came along. ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity, and it provides a standard API for accessing database management systems. The nice thing about it is you don't have to know those details. You don't have to know, you know wh specifically which C function to call to access SQL Server versus, versus MySQL. You call standardized functions, um, and we'll see those within in Visual Fox Pro, um, and you don't have to know all the details about a specific function. The nice thing about this is that you can actually, with the exception of maybe some slight differences in SQL statement syntax, can use the same code for different engines. So whether you're talking to SQL Server or MySQL or Oracle, the code that you write in Visual Fox Pro is the same. Like I said, maybe tweaking the SQL statements a little bit. Now, why would you want to use a remote database? We have a perfectly fine uh, database built right into Visual Fox Pro, but if you haven't worked with a remote database before, here are some reasons why you might want to think about it. Number one is file security. A DBF file is just a file sitting on disk, which means that it could be copied by a competitor or a disgruntled employee. It could be corrupted by, say, malware. It could be deleted, either accidentally or on purpose. Whereas those things aren't really um, doable in, uh, in most um, um, modern remote database systems. Data security. Anybody using Notepad can open up a DBF file and read the contents of the records there. Um, again, depending on which database we're talking about, um, most of the modern remote database systems have built-in security so that only authorized users has access to the data. Um, size is an issue. In Visual Fox Pro, we have a two gigabyte file limit. Now, if you're using Visual Fox Pro Advanced, um, one of the later versions provides uh, an increase over that. But for the most part, we're talking about a two gigabyte limit. Um, modern, again, modern database engines don't really have that, that kind of limit. Performance, we like to say that Visual Fox Pro is the fastest database engine on the planet. And that's true when we're talking about a, a, um, a desktop. But when you go over a network, especially maybe one that's based on Wi-Fi or maybe not the best performance of the, the network, then the rules change a little bit. If you're working with large tables, like some of the tables that I work with are, are you know, a gigabyte and a half, um, they, it, it can take a while to open those tables or to perform a query against those tables because to use Rushmore, Fox Pro needs to pull down as much and cache as much of the, say, the CDX file as it can. Whereas if you issue a query to a remote database, only the actual results are sent down the wire. So performance um, of, uh, say, SQL Server can be significantly faster than a Visual Fox Pro query, again, depending on the type of network or the type of environment you're working in.
So what we're going to look at in this session are ODBC SQL pass-through functions. We're not going to look at cursor adapters. We're not going to talk about remote views, although I will mention in one spot, I will mention remote views a little bit. But mostly we're going to focus on ODBC SQL pass-through functions. We're not going to talk about OLADB, which is another mechanism that Microsoft created for um, for uh, to prov provide an API for database access. And we won't talk about it for three reasons. One is that... Um, there are no native functions in Visual Fox Pro for OLADB like there are for, like there is for ODBC. Um, OLADB has kind of a murky future, I think. Um, some time ago, Microsoft announced that OLADB was being deprecated, and then a while later said that it's not being deprecated. So, you know, when you're that wishy-washy with something, it kind of maybe throws a little bit of fear into, into people. Um, and the third reason is that, in my experience, OLADB is um, significantly slower than ODBC is. Again, it could be a function because of the, you know, the built-in commands or the built-in functions that we have in Visual Fox Pro for ODBC. Um, but even so, like I said, it's not really important why. It's just, in my experience, OLADB is, is can, can significantly slower. All right, so let's do some ODC basics. If you if you have been working with ODBC for a while, this will be maybe a little bit of a refresher. But but like I said, hopefully we'll we'll hit some things that maybe you haven't seen before. So first of all, you have to use an ODBC driver. That's not the same as an OLADB provider. Um, so if you know if if you see a package that's available, say a, a download that's either ODBC or OLADB, you need the one that's the ODBC driver. It also has to be a 32-bit driver. Visual Fox Pro is a 32-bit application. Again, unless you're using Visual Fox Pro Advanced, the 64-bit version. But if you're using um, the 32-bit version of Visual Fox Pro Advanced or Visual Fox Pro, you have to have the 32-bit driver. So that means in the case of Access, for example, which has both 64 and 32-bit drivers or SQL Server or some of the other ones, again, make sure that you download and install the 32-bit driver. Um, some of the connection level settings can be uh, set with SQL set prop and Get the current value retrieved with SQL get, get prop. And some other settings are controlled with SQL set prop and, and read with SQL uh, with cursor get prop. And we'll look at both of uh, some examples of both of those functions in a little bit. <clears throat> so how do you connect to an ODC, ODBC data source? There are two ways. You can either use a connection string, which is sometimes called a DSNless connection, or you can use a DSN, which stands for data source name. So with a connection string, you'll use this function, SQL string connect. You pass the connection string, it returns a numeric value, a handle to that connection string. Uh, you need to keep track of this handle because you'll be using it in, in subsequent calls to the, um, to the remote database. Now the connection string comes as name value pairs. Um, one that is required is driver. So it'll be driver equals something. And the, the name of the driver is the same name that you would see in the uh, ODBC administrator, which we'll look at in a couple of minutes. But the spelling of the driver is very important. Uh, you have to type it exactly as that uh, driver name is known. That includes any spaces, any punctuation marks, uh, you know, parentheses, things like that. It has to be exactly spelled, otherwise it won't work. Um, if you're using a file-based database, such as Access, you won't be specifying a server. But if you are using something like SQL Server or, My server, My, or MySQL, you will be specifying uh, the server clause. Now, um, most database engines that I've seen use a keyword of server equals and then the name of the server. Some databases use slightly different terminology here. That's especially true for the next one, which is the database to connect to. SQL Server uses database, so you'd say database equals uh, Northwind or something like that. Other databases, however, use different, a different keyword here. For example, uh, both Access and Excel use DBQ. Some of them use data source and so on. So you need to look up the exact syntax that your ODBC driver expects to know what keyword to use there. Optionally, you can specify a username and password if that's required to connect to the database. Those can be specified in a variety of ways, but the, the common ones are UID for the username and PWD for the password. Now, as I mentioned, these connection strings can vary a lot from engine to engine. So there's a really good resource called connectionstrings.com. Let's go take a look at that. So here's connectionstrings.com. Let me just resize this a little bit. And you, as you can see, it provides information about tons of different databases, including Visual Fox Pro. Um, 
So let's look at, for example, MySQL. And you can see that um, you have the choice of .NET libraries. Well, that doesn't help us. OLAD providers, that's not what we're interested in either. It's the ODBC drivers section we want to look at. So we'll pick on the particular driver that we're using. And then here is the syntax that you would use to connect to that database. So it's driver equals this driver, server equals, database equals, user equals, uh, password equals, and so on. So uh, connectionstrings.com is a really good resource for figuring out exactly what kind of uh, what connection string you use you need to connect to a particular um, to a particular database um, oops let's go over to here let's look at visual fox pro so here's a program here where we're going to connect to a sql server database so i'm saying driver equals sql server server equals dhennig that's the name of my sql server on my machine database equals northwind that's the database we're going to connect to and in this case, trusted connection equals yes. This is a uh, SQL Server specific command here that says that I'm going to use uh, Windows security. I'm not going to use SQL Server security. Otherwise, if I was using SQL Server security, then I'd specify a user ID and a password. Now, one important thing to note is, unlike that example I just showed you, um, I don't recommend that you hard code a connection string in your program for two reasons. Well, probably more than two, but two, at least two reasons. One is it's a security risk. Anybody who gets access to that code, whether through decompiling or, or some of the techniques that Christoph has shown us over the years to, to hack into uh, programs, um, somebody can see that, that uh, connection string and then they'll know what the user ID and password is for your, for your database. The other reason is that those things can change. Usernames and passwords change all the time. Uh, server names can change. Somebody, re, you know, sets up a new server and switches over to that. Database names can change. So anything, anytime that, you know, information can change, you don't want to hard code it. Instead, you'll probably want to read it from some place, such as an INI file, uh, a DBF file, the Windows registry, whatever. I, al I also strongly recommend that you encrypt it. Um, you can use whatever encryption technique you want. Uh, for example, Craig Boyd's VFP encryption library is a really good choice. Um, but again, not storing it in plain text. One thing you might want to do, if you're using, a, if you create um, uh, custom applications for your clients, this is probably less useful. But if you are doing vertical market applications where you don't necessarily have access to their server, they're buying your software, they're installing it, and they have to have some way to tell your application how to connect to their to the server, you might want to provide a way for the user to enter it. And rather than having them type some big long string, you could actually use a builder. So here's an example of a of a builder that that I use in some of my applications. So let's just go and look at this code here. So here we're going to set library to the VFP encryption library I mentioned earlier. We're going to read from settings.ini a connection string. So let's go and take a look at what that looks like. And you can see that it's encrypted. Okay, that's not the actual password. That has been, that's an encrypted value. So we're going to read it from the INI file, and then we're going to call the decrypt function of the VFP encryption library to decrypt it, and then I'll just display it using a message box. Next, we're going to instantiate this SF con string builder and then see what it looks like, and then we'll display the, the connection string that's the result of that. So let's go and run this. All right, here's that decrypted connection string taken from that INI file. And then here's a connection string builder. So the nice thing about this is that the user doesn't have to know the exact name and the exact spelling and the, all the punctuation characters and so on for the ODBC driver. They can just pick it from a list. Um, we'll, we'll see this a little bit later on, but uh, one of the classes I'm providing with the sample files for this session is a class that knows how to read the o ODBC drivers that are available to you, as well as the data sources. And so here, for example, we could choose to pick one of these Excel drivers, for example. Um, if it's a server-based um, um, ODBC driver, you can specify a server. You can specify the database to connect to, optionally username and password, and other settings. Some, some ODBC drivers have other settings as well, so you can type those. And then what it does is it simply concatenates all those things together and shows you what the connection string is down here. It provides a test button so you can find out whether you have a valid connection string or not. If it fails, then it means you have to fix something. 
uh, and so on. So this this little connection string builder, um, I use this in in some of our applications as a way for the user to specify the connection string without having to know to type all of this stuff here. The other way you can connect to a data source is using a DSN, which is a data source name. Um, those are set up using the ODBC administrator. You have to use the 32-bit ODBC administrator. So when you click on the Windows Start button and type ODBC, you can see that there's actually two different ODBC administrators, the 64-bit one and the 32-bit one. We need a 32-bit administrator. And there are three different kinds of DSNs. There's a user DSN, which are specific for this user. And I'll show you why that is the case in just a moment. There's a system DSN, which as you can see, if you wanna be able to set up system DSNs, you have to have administrative privileges, but I, and I'm not logged in as an administrator here, but we can at least see them. And these are the system DSNs. So these would be available to any user logged into this machine. And finally, there's a file DSN. A file DSNs, in my experience, are not used very often. Um, because they're just a file sitting on disk somewhere. Now, all of the ODBC settings are actually stored in the Windows registry. So if we go and take a look here, let's go to, and take a look at this particular um, location here. So HKEY current user software, ODBC, ODBC.ini. You'll notice we see the same ODBC um, DSNs here that we see here. DBase files, Excel files, MSXX database. So those are the same things that we see here. And if we drew, we could drill down and see some of the properties, but won't worry about that. System DSN are stored in a different location in the registry. Oh, and so because these are stored for H key current user, that is user specific. So when I'm logged in as D Hennig, I see a certain set of, of um, uh, DSNs. If I log in as administrator, I would see a different set of DSNs because there are, they are user specific. If I go to the system one, this is in a different location. It's H key, um, local machine, et cetera. And again, we see the exact same settings here, the exact same DSNs here that we have in the system DSN. A file DSN, let's just go over here. Like I said, is just a file on disk somewhere. And here's an example of one here. And so it's really just a bunch of settings provided in, in a file. And like I said, in my experience, um, file DSNs really are not used very often at all. So <clears throat> once you've got your DSN created, then you connect to it using the SQL connect uh, function. You specify either the name of the DSN or because you can define connections in VFP um, uh, database, con uh, database containers, you can specify a connection that you created in a database container here as well. And then optionally, you specify a username and password. And again, like the SQL string connect, that returns a handle that we'll be using in the future. Now, another way that you can connect using a DSN is using the SQL string connect function that we saw a couple of minutes ago. But here, your, your connection string is DSN equals and then the DSN name. And then again, optionally, a username and password. As before, um, you may or may not want to hard code the DSN name. I mean, maybe that is acceptable. The connection string is not a good idea to hard code, but the, the DSN name might be. You know, if if it's if your application is called Trinity, you might have a DSN called Trinity, and that's just part of your documentation. The end user has to have a DSN on their machine named Trinity. Um, or you could perhaps let the user choose it rather than hard coding in your application. So let's take a look at um, connect to DSN. And here we're gonna use the SQL connect command function to connect to a, to a, a uh, DSN named Northwind, which we saw a minute ago in the ODBC ad administrator. That was one of the DSNs that, were, that was there. <clears throat> like I said, rather than hard coding it, we might wanna ask the user for it. If we take a look at this, at this form here, it has a combo box and the init method of combo box um, instantiates this SF registry ODBC, which is included with the samples for um, this session. And it has a get data sources method that, that fills an array with the various DSNs, both system and um, user. So when we run this, you can see here are the same DSNs we saw in the ODBC administrator. And now the user can pick one from the list 
rather than having to, you know, um, having have it hard coded, for example. So what should you use, a DSN or a connection string? One of the benefits of a DSN is that it hides the connection settings. You don't know what the database is. You don't know what the, the what database engine is being used, the, the driver. You don't know what server is being used. You don't know the name of the database. All that you know is you're connecting to a DSN named Trinity, for example. So that's, you know, that's sort of a plus in a way because if anything about that connection changes, then the administrator is responsible for going and changing the DSN and you your, your program doesn't know anything about it. It just knows that it connects to a DSN in Trinity and you don't care what it is. On the downside, the ODBC administrator requires administrative privileges to connect to if you are, if, if it's a system DSN that's being created. Um, and it may have require a higher level of knowledge than many users have. I didn't show you the process of creating an ODBC DSN, but it brings up a, a database specific dialogue and the user may or may not know what to do in that dialogue. So typically it's going to be, you know, like an IT person or administrator that's going to set up the DSN. On the other hand, a connection string, if you have your users fill in that connection string, whether it's, you know, storing it in the, in the INI file or what, you know, or you're asking for the connection string at, at the first time they start up the application, either way, it's probably going to require a higher level of knowledge that than the many users have. Um, again, so, you know, a bit more work, they may have to, you know, rely on that um, connectionstrings.com to know what connection string to enter for your application. Um, a downside for DSNs is that it must exist on the workstation. So if you've got 30 different workstations, somebody has to go to all 30 workstations and create that DSN. Now, it is possible to create a DSN programmatically. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so that might, you know, if you, if you, that's something you have to do regularly, then maybe it would be worth it to write some code to create that those DSNs programmatically. But otherwise, like I said, somebody has to go around to all those workstations. Whereas a connection string can be read from a shared resource. You know, again, INI file, a DBF or whatever, say sitting on a server somewhere that, that all applications would, would have access to. A connection string is also more flexible because um, sometimes the um, um, certain uh, databases require additional settings and you can specify them, them in a connection string and those settings may not necessarily be available in the UI provided uh, through the ODBC, ODBC administrator. All right, any questions at this point? Uh, yes, uh, since ODBC is 32-bit, will it be compatible with Windows 11? Um, there is no reason I can think of why it wouldn't be. Um, Windows 11 is still going to be available as it's a you know, probably a 64-bit machine, but it still supports 32-bit. So I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't. Okay, agreed. Uh, and uh, Christoph asks, uh, what happens if you name a user DSN quote ODBC data sources unquote? <laughs> uh, just Thanks. a little humor. Thanks, Christoph. <laughs> 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 I, I believe if that if, if that happens, I believe that every molecule in your body suddenly accelerates to light speed. <laughs> that was the exact answer that came to my mind as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now actually connecting to uh, an ODBC data source. Um, first of all, you'll, you must always, you know, whether you're using SQL connect or SQL string connect, always check the return value and use a error if it fails. Um, let's take a look at a program again. Let's look at this connect to DSN. So here we're connecting to uh, the Northwind database and we're checking that the value, the return value. So if the handle is less than zero, that means it failed to connect. So in that case, we're going to, now it doesn't throw an error or anything like that. It simply causes an error to occur, which you can grab via a error. Um, and then it's the third element of that, which has the message, for example. So here, if we try to connect to this data source and it fails, we'll display an error message and then we'll, we'll, we'll bug out. It, otherwise, we'll, we'll carry on. So if I run this code, it worked, right? Here's, here's a little query that we did. We'll talk about querying in a little bit, but it, it did work. However, watch what happens if I comment this out and uncomment this one. I don't have a DSN on my machine named Northwind XXX. So let's go and run this. And we notice that an error occurred and here's the error message. 
This one, by the way, data source name not found is usually is one of two, two things. Either you specified a DSN that doesn't exist as in this case, or you specified a driver, a like driver equals, and then some driver name that doesn't exist either. Then you'll typically get, this is the error message that you'll typically get in that case. So like I said, important to check the return value and then do something about it if it fails. Now you're gonna have to do something with that handle. Um, you could store it in a local variable. You could store it somewhere global. Depends on what you're going to be doing with it. But you need to to do some store that handle somewhere because you're going to be you you need it for some of the functions that we'll see in a, in a bit. Now one of the things that happens, you'll notice that, for example, you notice that when I tried to access that Northwind XX data source, that um, nothing popped up. It just an, an error occurred, but no dialog popped up. That's because on my machine I have SQL set prop disk login set to three, which means don't display a login dialog. Um, it may not be set to that on your machine or on the user's machine or in your application. Uh, other values are always display the login dialog or only display the login dialog if the, log, if the initial connection fails. Now, the problem is that this login dialog is not really user friendly, shall we say. It's fine, say, for a developer or say an IT uh, person, but it's not the kind of dialog you want your users to see. So my recommendation is that you normally use SQL set prop, set disk blog into three. The first parameter here is the connection handle. Uh, zero means from now on, like for basically for all connections that, you know, that we're gonna make, that's what we wanna use for logins. Um, you can also say now, however, um, some databases, I don't know if this is still true, but I have run across some database engines in the past. I think maybe Firebird was one of them where it required that login dialog to appear. Otherwise it just wouldn't connect at all. So in that case, you'd set disk blog into to one or two, for example. Um, you can also set the connection timeout. The default is 15 seconds. So if, if after 15 seconds it doesn't connect, then it will, you know, and it'll fail to connect and then you'll have to check a error. But if you, for example, know you're running over a slow connection, you can increase that value to, to, to something higher. Disconnecting. So after you're finished with your that connection, you'll want to disconnect from the from the data source. The reason for that is because you don't want to leave those you know the connection open forever. I mean, I guess if your application terminates, it it can connect, but disconnect. But you want to close those connections in a orderly manner because some database engines are licensed by you know per user or per connection. So you know to keep those licensing costs down, you should probably disconnect when you when you're not using it. So you'll either call SQL disconnect by passing the handle that you want to disconnect, or if you pass zero, that means disconnect all remote data sources. This does return a result, but in my experience, most people don't bother looking at it. I mean, either you disconnected or you didn't, and there's not much you can do about it. So most of the time, like I said, you just use SQL disconnect and, and probably don't bother checking that return value. Now there are two models for working with remote data sources. One is that you connect, Issue your query, you disconnect. Connect, issue your query, disconnect, and so on throughout the application. The other one, which is probably more popular, at least with the Visual Fox for developers, is to connect at application startup, stay connected through the life of the application, and keep on using that, that handle property. And at the end of the application, you, you disconnect. Now, back in the day, um, like I said, this the second mechanism is the or the model is the one that was probably more popular and probably still is today, just you know because of that. Um, and the reason for that is because making a connection was kind of an expensive operation. Um, you know, it had to find the it had to you know set up the set up the um, API calls. It had to go and find the engine. It had to you know check the, make sure it was working, it had to authenticate, it had to do the connection, set up a bunch of resources and so on. So it could take, you know, several seconds to connect to the, to the, to the, um, to the database engine. Um, most database, or not most, but a lot of database engines these days, however, support application pooling and, and ODBC itself supports application pooling if your database engine does. That means that when you disconnect from a data source, that it doesn't actually drop the connection to, to that data source, it simply returns it to a pool of open connections. So the next time you go to connect, it looks in its pool first and says, oh, you know what? I've already got a connection that you know uses the same driver server database that you asked for last time. So it just gives you that connection handle and doesn't actually re, you know, do that connection over again. 
So that means that it doesn't take, you know, several seconds. It might be instantaneous to, to reconnect that data source. So this connect, requery, and disconnect model is certainly a lot more viable than it was, um, you know, before connection pooling became available. Um, one thing you might want to do is to set the idle timeout property using SQL set prop, set the idle timeout property. What happens here is that if a connection hasn't been used in a while um, for several minutes, you can have it automatically disconnect rather than, you know, keeping that connection, that connection live. The default value for this is zero, which means don't, don't have a, a disconnection automatically, but you could set it for say 10 minutes. If no SQL query has been issued for 10 minutes, then, then disconnect from, from the data source. And we'll see another way that you can handle that uh, later on. You can actually create shared connections, both streak, SQL string connect and SQL connect except a, the last parameter is a, is a logical, true or false, that indicates whether the connection that you just created is shareable or not. It'll return a handle, as we saw before. But then if you want to create a, a, use that connection over again with a different handle, you specify SQL connect and then just the handle. So we're not specifying a, a DSN this time. We're just saying SQL connect handle, and it gives you a new handle. Now, Internally, Fox Pro, I mean, the handles that we get are numeric values. The first one you make is a one, the second one's a two, and so on. So you'll get a new numeric value here. Internally, um, Visual Fox Pro has uh, connection handles and statement handles. I go into more detail about that in the white paper, so I'm not going to talk about it much here. But what's happening here is that we're getting a new handle that we can use for our queries, but internally it's a, sh it's a shared connection. So it's not really making a new connection to the database. One of the places you can use this is with the remote views. For example, you can, if you've already done this shared connection, you can then say, use remote view con string and then specify that handle. And now you're not making a new connection to the database at this point. You can determine whether a handle has, is shared or not by using SQL get prop and asking for the shared property. So let's take a look at an example of a shared connection. So here we're going to create a database container and we're going to create a connection to the, that Northwind SQL Server database in the database. Then we're going to create a couple of remote views, one that selects star from customers, one that selects star from orders. Okay. Now we're going to use SQL string connect. We're going to connect to that, D, that Northwind DSN, but I'm passing the true parameter here, meaning this is a shareable connection. That'll give us handle one. Then we're going to call SQL connect using handle one, and that will be in handle two. Now let's open the database. Let's SQL connect to that, that not, it's not a DSN now. This is that uh, database connection that we created here. And again, we'll make that shareable. So now we've got three different handles that we've got here. Now let's open the Northwind customers view, remote view. Let's open the Northwind orders remote view. And now let's show some information about those those um, handles. So let's just go and run this. Let's move this over a little bit. Let's go and run this. Uh, oops, yeah, yeah. Sorry, cancel. Hang on. Beer all. Beer. Okay, so here are my connection handles. Here's the VFP handle. Here is the ODBC connection handle. Here's the ODBC statement handle. So you notice that although I have five different VFP handles, I the first two are have the same co connection handle because this is the first one I created. This one is shared with it. Then I created another win, one and I shared it with these other ones. So even though I have what looks like five different connections to SQL Server, SQL Server only sees two connections. Each of them has a different statement handle, but only two connection handles here. <clears throat> now, normally when you, um, uh, oops, sorry. Normally when you um, issue a query, for example, or say open a remote view, um, it wait, you have to wait until that remote view is, is open or the query is finished before you can go and use a shared connection um, handle again. And if you, if you don't wait, then you'll get an error message. However, if you use cursor set prop to, to set, allow simultaneous fetch to true, that means you will allow simultaneous access to that connection handle. So let's go and take a look at that. Let me just clear the screen here. <clears throat> 
So again, same co code here. We're going to create a, remote, a, a database container. We'll create a connection. We'll create a couple of, we'll actually just going to create one view here. Select star from customers. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the, the proper, the fetch as needed property for this remote view to true. That means that it will only retrieve this many records. So I'm setting fetch size to 10. So it's only going to retrieve 10 records. And then it will stop retrieving records until I move the record pointer past that 10th record. Then it will retrieve the next 10 records. And if I move to the 21st record, it'll retrieve the next 10 records and so on. So we're just going to be fetching records as needed. We're not going get, to be getting them all in one fell swoop. Okay, so let's open that remote view. And now let's go and use SQL Connect to connect to that, that connection, but we'll make it a shareable connection, a shareable connection. And now we're going to issue a SQL pass-through function. We're going to say select star from employees. And we'll see what happens. If that fails, then we'll get an error and we'll see what that error message is. Now let's try it again, but this time we're going to set the allow simultaneous fetch property of that remote view to true, meaning that we don't necessarily have to wait until everything is done before we can reuse that handle. So again, let's open up the remote view. Let's create the, that shared connection handle. Let's issue the exact same query. So from this point on, the code is exactly the same. Okay, so let's run this. And we do get an error on the first one. Connection is busy with results for another H statement. Um, the reason for that is because we hadn't finished fetching all the records from the remote view. We only fetched 10, and then we're basically sort of in a pause state. And that connection handle is still, or that uh, that statement handle is still busy. And so it won't allow us to be used in a shared mode. However, the second time we issue it, now it did work. So even though we only had 10 records and there's still more pending, the, the query that we issued with the SQL exec command did succeed and, and no errors there. If you want to know before you issue a query, if you want to know if your connection handle is busy, you can use SQL get prop and grab and get the connection busy setting. Any questions? Not at this time. Okay. All right. So now managing connections. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're using the connect at application startup, use the same handle throughout the whole application. Um, you know, shut it down at the end, you have to store that handle in some in some global location. So whether it's a property of underscore screen or whether it's um, a global variable, uh, I like to use a manager object and store it as a property of the manager object. So let's go and take a look at that. So I have this SF connection manager. By the way, everything I'm showing you is in the samples uh, for the, the that uh, you can download for this session. So here's my connection manager. We'll just take a look at one method here called connect. Um, there's a C con string property that has to be set to the connection string to use, and it'll give you an error message if it if you haven't done that. And then it checks to see if our n handle property hasn't already been set, meaning we haven't already connected. Then let's go and do a bunch of stuff. The nice thing about this is you can connect, you can call connect over and over again. You can call connect before every query if you want to. What'll happen is it'll only connect the first time. On subsequent calls, it'll see that the connection handle is greater than zero. And so it simply bypasses all this code and 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 everything is fine. Anyway, so if you do need the disk login um, set to three, never or a set to something other than three, um, set the L display login property to true. That means I do want to see the display login if the connection fails. Then we use the SQL string connect to connect to that data source. And we store the handle if it succeeds in the end handle property. Otherwise, we get the error message. We set the C error message property to that error message. And we're going to return false that the connection failed. So if we take a look at a little program that tests that, here's my test con manager. So let's actually just, oops, sorry, go back to here. So. Um, Let's just go ahead and uh, run this. Oh, well, let's look at the code first, I guess. So again, set library to the VFP encryption library. I'm going to instantiate my connection manager um, uh, class. And then I'm going to read that connection string that we saw earlier in, from the settings that I and I, and we're going to decrypt it and set, save that as the C con string property of the connection um, object. And then we're going to call the connect method. And then if it worked, then we're going to go in and use that handle to go and execute our SQL statement. So let's go and run this. And there's our, our results. So it, it, everything worked so far. 
Now, um, there's this interesting function called SQL idle disconnect. I, if I recall, this was added in VFP9. I could be wrong about that, but I think it was, I think it was added in VFP9. What SQL idle disconnect does is it disconnects from the data source, but again, it's sort of me, it's almost like connection pooling internal to VFP. It, it disconnects from the data source, but it keeps that, that handle available, that, 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 um, that connection available. So the next time you issue a query against it, it reconnects to that data source automatically. Um, there's also another function called asql handles that, that will fill an array with the handles that are currently uh, open. So let's carry on with this program. I, I, I brought up the debugger, but then I you know, kind of jumped back to the slide. So let's go and take a look at this and let's carry on with this. So let's use SQL idle disconnect on that, the connection handle, the handle property of that connection object, okay? Now let's go and use SQL get prop to go and get the, the ODBC um, connection handle and the ODBC statement handle for that handle. And you'll notice that they're both zero, meaning that as far as we're concerned, we have now disconnected from that, that ODBC connection. But if we call SQL handles and display the first element of the array, you can see that we do have uh, a connection handle. It's handle number one. It's st we still know about that handle. Now, without reconnecting to the database, let's go in and reissue that SQL statement again. So you might expect this would fail because we have disconnected. However, it does succeed. And in fact, we can see now that the uh, connection handle is, it has a different value and the statement handle has a different value than it's not non-zero and there's our result set, okay? So SQL idle disconnect um, is basically a way of um, temporarily shutting down a connection but then reusing it again automatically when you need it. Um, in the white paper, I talk about one use of that and that is to, if you are working on a, say a, a network, maybe it's a Wi-Fi network or, or a, a you know, wide area network, something like that, where the connection might be a little flaky. Um, the problem is whenever you issue a SQL exec, if you assume that that connection handle is still good, it may not be, and now your SQL, your query is gonna fail. And so the white paper has an example of where, of how you can, how you can resolve that issue using SQL, SQL idle disconnect. Any questions? All have been handled. Okay. All right. So now we talked about, we spent a lot of time talking about just connecting and disconnecting. Now let's actually talk about doing something, although I've shown some examples of SQL exec, but uh, let's actually talk about using our, our uh, connection. One of the functions is SQL exec. This is probably the most common function that you'll use. You specify a handle as the first parameter. So that's why you'll want to keep that handle around. Optionally, you'll specify a SQL command. You might be wondering, well, when would you ever not be specifying a command? We'll show you an example later on. Uh, optionally, you can specify a cursor name and optionally you can specify the name of an array that will be filled with um, counts of how many records were affected by the SQL command. As with the SQL connect and SQL string connect, always check the return value and use a error if it fails to find out what went wrong. If a result set was returned and you did not specify the C cursor name uh, parameter, then the cursor will automatically be named SQL result. If you don't wanna get all records from the database for some reason, you can use cursor set prop to set max records to a particular value. Um, well, you may be wondering, well, why don't I just use the top N clause of a SQL statement? Mm, that, that's a perfectly good, thing to do, except top end might require an order by clause. And, and because of SQL language differences, not all database engines support the top end clause, whereas this max records works with, with pretty much everything. So let's go take a look at an example of that. So here we're going to, now I know I said you always check the return value of your SQL string connect. Um, again, this is demo code, so I'm going to assume that we're going to connection is going to succeed. So we're going to connect to SQL Server. We're going to use SQL Exec to to issue a SQL statement against that handle. Now, in this case, it's going to fail. There is no table called Customer. It's actually called Customers. So this is going to fail. That's why we always check the return value of the SQL Exec and we handle it if it failed. Okay. Now here again, when I say always, I mean always when you're not doing a demo. So um, here we are going to issue the SQL exec uh, 
for customers. This one should be named, this cursor should be named SQL result because we, we're not specifying the name of the cursor to specify. This one, however, we are specifying that parameter that we showed that, so the cursor should be called customers. Next, we're gonna set max records to 10, issue the same SQL statement again, and then, and then browse, and then just set it back again. So let's go and run this. And our first SQL statement fails because there is no uh, table called customer in our database. That's why you always check the return value of your SQL exec command. Here's our browse called SQL result because we didn't specify a cursor name. Here's our browse with the cursor name customers. And here are only 10 customers, even though there's 93 customers in the, Nor in the Northwind database, we're only getting 10 because of that max records uh, cursor set prop. The last parameter here, by the way, is the, is the, um, is the connection handle to use, or the, sorry, the, the work area to use. Um, if your database contains Unicode values, you'll probably want to use sys987 comma true to map those to ANSI. And I'll show you why, because here we're going to connect to the AdventureWorks database and we're going to go and do a SQL statement against this particular table. But we'll have this set to false first. In other words, get, bring in the Unicode values as Unicode and browse it. Then let's set it to true. Let's map it to ANSI and browse again. So let's go and run that. And, oops, wait a second. Let's run that. Oh, what's going on here? It's running the wrong program. Hmm. Something weird is happening here. <laughs> I want to execute this program. And it is doing something totally different. Okay. Anyway, what we, I have no idea why that's happening. So anyway, so uh, what we would have seen is that the, um, the browse window that came up uh, had a memo field and that memo field would have weird blank spaces between every character. That's because it, they're actually two bytes per character with the second character being a, being a CHR zero. The second time we issue it, it would we'd actually see the the actual you know the content of the memo without Unicorn converted to ANSI. Um, remember to use delimiters for illegal names, so names that have spaces in them, or you know perhaps start with numbers, or have punctuation marks, or are reserved words. Like for example, a very common column name is DESC for as an abbreviation for description, but DESC is also a reserved word, you know, descending, you know, for an order by clause. So remember to put delimiters around them. Um, Delimiters vary from database to database. SQL Server uses square brackets. Some database engines require quote, double quotes. Um, MySQL uses the reverse apostrophe and, and so on. So you might have, you, you have to maybe check your, your ODBC um, uh, data source and, and find out what kind of delimiters are required there. Now, one important thing to remember is that the SQL command has to be in the syntax of the engine that you're actually hitting. For example, this is a perfectly valid uh, SQL statement in Visual Fox Pro, but it would fail in SQL Server for four reasons. One, S-E-L-E -E is a four-letter abbreviation for select, which Fox Pro allows, but SQL Server does not. It has to be spelled out fully. Uh, semicolon in Visual Fox Pro is a line separator. Carriage returns are statement separators. Semicolons are line separators. In SQL Server, it's just the opposite. A Carriage return is a line separator, so I can have multi-line statements, and semicolons are optionally um, statement separators. So that's another reason this would fail. There is no between function in SQL Server. I'd have to use the between clause instead, and there is no date function in SQL Server. I have to use the get date function, and to do date math, you depending on what what kind of math you're doing. Sometimes you can do the subtraction directly. Sometimes you have to use the date add function, for example, to add or subtract subtract days. Um, I find it really handy to use the text command rather than saying something like LC sequel equals quote and then some big long string. I like to use the text command. Um, and then put the SQL statement with as many lines as you want to, depending on your database engine, if it supports multi-line statements, and then as many lines as you want to, and then end text, and then, ex then exec SQL exec against that, that particular variable. Um, like we had a connection timeout, you can have a query timeout. Um, so you can specify how many seconds to, to wait before that query fails. 
Um, map Varchar, if you cursor set prop map Varchar, you may want to set that to true. If you don't, then what happens is that Varchar uh, columns in your database will come in as character columns. So they may be padded with spaces, um, you know, to the length of the field. Um, same thing with map binary. If that, if you don't specify this map binary true, um, then uh, b uh, then um, certain kinds of binary columns in your database engine will come into Fox Pro as general um, fields, and they're typically they're cor typically corrupted general fields. So you can't do anything with them. If you set this to true, then they'll come in as a blob, and then then you can do something with them typically. So parameterized SQL statements. So if you want to specify a parameter, rather than a hard-coded literal value in your SQL statement, you specify question mark and then some expression. Like, for example, assuming that I've got a variable called LDDate1 and another one called LDDate2, I can use this statement with question marks in front of those variable names. Or they could be field names. For example, I could say, you know, customers dot. Uh, company name. So anything that's in scope, any kind of expression that can be evaluated can be used as um, as a parameter. If your parameter is more complex than just a field, a variable name or a um, a field name in a in a cursor or a table, then surround it with parentheses. What FoxPro will do then is it will evaluate this expression inside the the parentheses and then use the return value as the parameter. Let's go and take a look at a parameterized query. So again, we're going to connect to our database. We're going to um, set a couple of variables to certain dates. Now, before we use a parameterized one, let's let's do it the old way using a constructed SQL statement. So, because remember, a SQL statement is just a string. So we have to build up a string that contains the values that we want. Well, the problem is I can't pass these date values because you know I. I a date value is a date value. I can't combine it with a, with a, a character value, which is my SQL statement. So I have to convert it into some kind of character format that is compatible with my database engine. So I can use this transform statement to put it into a year-month-day format. And then I'm going to put single quotes around it inside my SQL statement. So that's kind of, that's kind of ugly, um, but it, it'll work. The better way to do it is by using a parameterized query. So I simply specify, I don't have to worry about formatting at all. I just specify question marks around those variables. The other, the other thing that this is handy with is that now if I want a different date range, I would have to reconstruct my SQL statement because it's got hard-coded values in it. I have to reconstruct it again, as opposed to simply executing the SQL statement again with different parameter values this time. So when we run it, here's my constructed SQL statement. And it works. There's my results. Now here's the one that's going to, here's my parameterized SQL statement. And it works. Here's the, my July orders. Here's my August orders. I didn't have to reconstruct the SQL statement. I just reissued the query with a different set of parameters. Now, there are several benefits to using a parameterized statement. One is, as we saw, we don't have to worry about formatting non-strings. We don't have to worry about single quotes around um, around. Um, character literal values, we don't have to worry about formatting things that aren't strings like dates and booleans and, and numbers and all those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> a, if, if you issue a second call, even with different values, um, a lot of data database engines will optimize. They'll, they'll figure out a, a, an execution plan, then they'll execute it. And the second time they see the same SQL statement, they simply execute that, 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 you know, that, that optimized plan. If you specify different parameter values or different values in a hard-coded string, it's no longer the same SQL statement. And so it can't use the, the previously used execution plan. And of course, the, the biggest reason for using a parameterized statement is the old Bobby Tables uh, problem. And that is SQL injection made famous by the, made famous by this XK, uh, XKCD cartoon. And, and SQL injection means that if somebody formats their, uh, you know, if you allow the user to type in a value and you search for that value, say, depending on how they format that value, it's possible that they can execute SQL statements like dropping tables, for example. Any questions about, so far? Not at this time. Okay. Calling store procedures is straightforward. You simply use the exec keyword followed by the procedure name and then your parameters. Now, remember, if your, if your stored procedure has any illegal characters in it, like a space, you have to put delimiters around it, as I've done in this example here. So here, we're going to set LD date one to a couple of date values. 
obviously I'm hard coding them in a real application that, you know, you'd be asking the user for them or reading them from somewhere, but then I'm simply going to specify those as my parameters for my, in my SQL exec command passed to that, um, that stored procedure. If you have output parameters, not all stored procedures do, but some, some, some do. And in that case, you'd specify question mark at, and then the variable name to retrieve the values of, of um, uh, output parameters. <clears throat> Some database engines, such as SQL Server, support multiple statements. Um, if you use, as I mentioned earlier, a semicolon is a, uh, a statement delimiter in SQL Server. And so I can specify multiple SQL statements in a single SQL exec um, command. And then I'll get um, multiple result sets back. And in fact, SQL exec will return the number of result sets. Normally it returns one if there's only one result set, um, but if there's three, it'll return, it'll return three. The cursors are named with an incrementing suffix. So if I don't specify uh, the, the name of the cursor to use, the first cursor will be SQL result. The second one will be SQL result one, SQL result two, and so on. If I do specify a name such as customers, they'll be called customers, customers one, customers two, again, and so on. So let's go and take a look at that. Okay, so here we're going to um, connect to our database. We're going to set batch mode to true. We'll talk about batch mode in a second. And then I'm going to issue a SQL statement that contains two commands in it, two SQL statements. Uh, select star from customer, select star from employees. And I'm specifying my cursor as the um, as the name of the cursor to create. But of course, they're going to be called my cursor, the one for customers, and it'll be my cursor one for employees. <clears throat> now, that's with batch mode set to true, meaning basically wait until all the results have been returned. So, so ln result is going to be a two in this case because we have two cursors that were created. However, what if I want to um, give them different names? Or what if I want to you know, get the first result set back before it's necessarily finished for the query for the, for the other ones? So in that case, we'll set batch mode to false, meaning don't do it in batch mode, do it sort of in, on an as on demand mode. This time we're gonna execute, or yeah, we're gonna issue three SQL statements, display what the result is, and then we're gonna go into a loop. Because when you set batch mode to false, then what you have to do is you have to call SQL more results. This one will give you the first cursor back because it won't wait for all three of them to return. It'll give you just the first cursor back. And then in a loop, you're going to call SQL more results and go and get the next cursor. And you're basically going to check the return value here for one of, of a few different values. Zero means it's still executing. So we'll just, we won't do anything. We'll just go back, you know, to back in, into the loop again. A one means we have received the result set. And in this case, we're actually going to change the name of the cursor. So we're specifying the name of the cursor, which we did, by the way, for employees as well. The first one's going to be called customers. Then we change the name to use to employees. And we specify that here. Once we've received the employees um, cursor, then we're going to change the name to products. So the third time through, the next time through, we'll change this to products. When the result set returns or when uh, SQL exec returns to our SQL more results returns two, that means we're done. All of the SQL statements have executed, all the result sets have been returned and so on. And of course, the last possibility is that an error occurs. It'll be a negative value. So in a loop, we're gonna be checking, we're gonna be calling SQL more results to go get the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on. So let's run this. And the first time we get two, because that was the, that was our first, our first SQL exec that had two different result sets. Here's my cursor, which is customers, and here's my cursor one, which is employees. All right, with the next one, where I'm issuing the three statements, but with batch mode set to false, I get one result set back. It's called customers, and it contains the customers table. Now we're going into the loop, and we're calling SQL more results. It returns one, which is our next result set, named employees, and then we go back into the loop, we call SQL more results. It returns one again. This time the cursor is called products. And then we go back into the loop. We call SQL more results again. Now it returns two, meaning all of the SQL statements have executed. And so now we're done. <clears throat> sort of related to this, but, but different. 
is asynchronous processing. Normally, when you execute a SQL statement, um, it waits until all the results have been returned. However, what if you're issuing a big, you know, a, a SQL statement against a big table, like, you know, 500,000 records? Um, that might take a little while. And the problem is there's no way for the user to stop it. Once it started doing that, you know, SQL exec command, the user can hit escape all they want to. Fox Pro doesn't care. It's waiting until that, that, that result set is returned before it returns results, before it, you know, re returns command back to Fox Pro. And now it can, it can do something like, you know, stopping, stopping what it's doing. But you had to wait until that SQL exec was finished. So if you set the a SQL set prop and you set asynchronous to true, then in that case, it will return uh, almost immediately. And then you will execute, um, um, you'll keep on calling SQL exec in a loop with either the same command or even no command. You can just say SQL exec in the handle and it'll keep on executing that SQL statement. Um, and you'll keep on doing that until it no longer returns zero, meaning I'm, I'm, still, I'm still executing. Now, at some point, if you want to terminate the SQL statement before it's actually finished executing, you'll call SQL cancel. Um, and then you could check to see how many records were fetched and whether the fetch is complete or not. So let's go and run this. <clears throat> so here we're going to connect to our database. We're going to set async to true, and we're going to set the fetch size to 1,000. So we're going to get 1,000 records at a time. We're going to set escape on. We're going to on escape ll cancel equals true. And then we're going to go into a loop where we execute this SQL statement from this fairly large table, I think it's got about four or five hundred thousand records, something like that. Um, and then we're going to we're going to specify that that optional array property, so we can see how many records we retrieve this time. Now we check the return the the um, return value of SQL exec. If it's zero, that means it's still executing. So let's see how many just display how many records we retrieved. If an error occurs, we know we have to deal with that. Otherwise, we're done. So once it's returned a non-zero value, that means we're done. And then we can we can you know display we'll browse the the result set. However, if the user pressed escape somewhere along the way, then we're going to drop out of the loop. And in that case, this value variable is true. Let's actually issue SQL cancel so that it doesn't keep on executing that SQL statement. Okay, so let's just move this guy out of the way here, and we'll just run this. Oh oh. Well, something happened to my SQL server. Let's, uh, well, you always check that return value, right? Let's go and uh, go back in there. Okay, well, some for some reason, my SQL server just went away. Um, Okay, well, we'll move on then. What we would have seen had this worked properly, what we would have seen is it displays the records received. So we would see records retrieved 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and, and basically carrying on until like all 500,000 were retrieved. Or if I pressed escape, then we would have dropped out of the loop, executed that SQL cancel function, and then it would have, and then it was stopped after receiving like say 30,000 records or, you know, at whatever point I, I stopped that. All right, well, the rest of the session, I may have to just do the old hand puppet thing if, uh, if, that's, uh, if SQL Server is going to come back to life for us. So we'll, we'll see what happens here. Uh, oh, sorry, any questions so far? Yes. Okay. Um, can you do async operations with multiple requests? Um, I haven't tried that, but I think you can. You'd use a combination of async and the SQL more results. So in other words, you'd issue your SQL exec, and then you'd issue SQL more results. Um, so you, you'd use a combination of both techniques. Like I said, I haven't tried it, but I, I, think, I think it would work. Okay. Um, and then another question, why use fetch size greater than zero or async? I usually need all the data of a result set scenarios. Well, yes, you 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 definitely need all the results from your result set to do something with it. However, what if you want your user to be able to stop the process? Like, okay, this query is going to take 10 minutes. You know what? I'll let me just press escape to stop it. I'll I'll try it again at a later date. Well, the problem is 
if you don't use uh, that um, that asynchronous, then there's no way to stop it. I mean, it just runs until that query is finished. So it so one of the reasons for one of the purposes for that is to provide a way for the user to stop the query from running. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, um, you can prepare SQL statements. So if you use the SQL prepare function, it takes the SQL statement and depending on the database engine, it might create an execution plan for it. And then when you execute, notice I'm just executing the handle. I'm not specifying a SQL statement because at this point it's just gonna execute the, the statement I had previously prepared. And now, you know, theoretically it might run faster even if I, you know, when I specify these different values here. Getting a little short on time. So I'm just gonna kind of go through this a little on the quick side. Um, cause I want to show you some, some kind of fun stuff at the end, um, transactions. So the way that you start a transaction with ODBC is you set SQL, SQL set prop, you set transactions to two. That basically is like a, you know, set transaction on kind of thing. Then we're going to do the, you know, sort of the, the hello world of a transaction. We're going to take a hundred dollars from one bank account and put it into another bank account as two separate statements. There's a semicolon here. And then we're going to SQL exec that now. If it failed for some reason, so if LN result is less than zero, um, then we're going to issue a SQL rollback. If it succeeded, we'll issue a SQL commit. And if the SQL commit failed, then we'll, you know, we'll use a error to figure out what went wrong and, and deal with it. And then we'll set SQL, we use SQL set prop to set transactions back off again, setting it to one. So this is, this is how you do transactions you, in ODBC, not, not specific for SQL Server or MySQL or anything. It's a generic transaction processing for uh, Visual Fox Pro against a remote database. There are three generations, if you're using SQL Server, uh, there are three generations of SQL Server drivers. There's SQL Server, SQL Server native client something, 11.0 being the, the latest version. And the newest one is ODBC driver something for SQL Server, where the number 17 is the latest version there. Um, SQL Server is the oldest one. It has the benefit that it's, uh, it comes installed with Windows. So there's nothing new to install on your user's machines. The downside is that it doesn't know anything about some of the newer data types in SQL Server, such as even a date type, which I think was added in like, I don't know, 2007 or something like that. So uh, it doesn't know anything about some of those newer date types. And so if your database does use newer date types, you probably won't want to use this particular driver. The SQL Server native client was sort of its replacement, but it has since been superseded with this newer one. So there really isn't a good reason to use the SQL Server native client anymore. It still works just fine. It's just not being developed anymore. And so this is the one that you're most likely going to want to use. You do have to install um, the, this particular driver on the user's machine, though. So I, in, the, in the white paper, there is a uh, download link to, for, to, to install that. And now, there are other differences between the um, drivers. And they're described in detail in the white paper. And if for some reason my SQL Server magically came back again, we may be able to run this. But if not, then say la vie. Yeah, it looks like it's it looks like it's hanging up. Okay. Let's kill that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like I said, I've never actually had SQL Server die on me like that before. But anyway, let's just go and take a look at this program very quickly. So um, one of the differences, as, as I mentioned, well, sorry, let's back up. So we're going to connect to two different drivers. One is the SQL Server one, which, as I mentioned, is the older one, but comes with Windows. This one is the newer one that has to be installed, but it does know about um, the new data types in SQL Server. So we have two different connection handles here. Here we're going to retrieve a date column from SQL Server using the older driver. I'm, the reason I'm displaying um, the uh, var type here is because you'll actually see it comes, you would have seen that it came in as character. So it would be like 20 you know, 2021 dash 10 dash 20 as a character value. Whereas using the newer connection, you know, the newer ODBC driver using this connection handle, it would come in as an actual date value. Now, if for some reason you have to use that SQL Server driver, you can uh, cast it as a date time and then recast it as a date and that'll work as well. Uh, Varkar max columns come into the older SQL Server driver just fine as a memo field. Using the newer driver due to a bug in VFP, they actually come in as, as an empty string, uh, character zero or um, a length of zero. Um, 
if you're using Visual Fox Pro Advanced, which I am, um, that bug is fixed. And so it would come in as a proper set of data. The workaround, if you're not using Visual Fox Pro Advanced, is to cast it as text in your SQL statement. All right, so unfortunately, I can't run that code because, like I said, SQL Server died, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure why. But anyway, I want to go on to the next, the last topic anyway. I like working with a uh, data manager that handles, instead of you know issuing SQL exec commands and having to deal with A error and what to do about it and so on all over the place, I like to work with a connection, um, or sorry, with a data manager object that deals with, you know, abstracts a lot of this stuff for me. So included with the um, samples for this session is uh, this SF data manager class. It automatically collaborates with SF connection manager. So it has an OCON property you can set to the connection manager if you're using it. Or if you have a GeoCon global variable, it'll look for that as well. And if so, it knows what connection to use. It automatically handles parameters. So you can use this question mark uh, syntax, but you can also use curly braces around your expressions. And that, that, means, that means you don't have to use um, uh, parentheses around your more complex expressions. This also has the benefit of being able to uh, log the actual values that were used at the time that the SQL statement was, was issued. And so that you get some, some better debugging at it, out of it. Now, one thing that's required is that these variables have to be in scope. Um, in other words, they have to be declared as private or global. They can't be local to the method that's calling them because when you're calling a method of an object, it wouldn't see those local variables. If you don't want to declare them as private, you can instead use an add parameter uh, method that to call to, to say LD1 has value of this date and LD2 has a value of this date and so on. Um, it automatically converts VFP syntax to SQL Server syntax. So the nice thing here is if you're taking an existing Fox Pro application that has a SQL statement that looks kind of like this, all you have to do is add a text to LC SQL in front of it and an end text after it, and then call the execute method of the uh, data manager object. It'll automatically convert that Visual Fox Pro formatted SQL statement, taking out the semicolons, changing the between function to a between clause into this SQL statement. Now, it doesn't handle all instances of VFP to SQL Server syntax. It handles the ones that I needed. So it handles things like the T to D function and the C to D function and, and uh, in, or in list converts to an in and so on. So it handles tons of different things, but not everything. So if you, if you need some more of the, some of the, some of the, uh, if you need to convert some things that it doesn't handle, you have the source code, so you can, you can play with that. It has a variety of methods that will perform different CRUD operations and it automatically does logging. So in the log table, um, it will control, it'll contain things such as the date, time, the name of the user, uh, the SQL statement that it was executed, how long it took, how many records were returned, whether it failed or not, what the error message was, um, and, 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 and other things as well. So let's go and take a look at a uh, sample program for this. Let's just see if I can connect to this again. Let's just try one more time here. Oh, well now it does seem to be working. Okay, let's try the connection string. Okay, so whatever happened to my SQL server appears to have been fixed now. Okay, so now we can go and, and take a look at this. So let's take a look at this data manager. All right, so let's just run it. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to uh, set the library. We're going to instantiate the connection manager. We're going to read the connection string and decrypt it and store it in the CCON string property of our con object. We're now gonna instantiate a data manager, set the username. This is just used for logging purposes. We'll tell it that we do want logging to occur and we want it to log to a table named sqlog.dbf. Let's execute a SQL statement using the curly brace uh, syntax here. So here I'm gonna set a couple of variables. Notice that they're private. And here is my SQL statement that we're gonna execute. So we're gonna use these curly braces and, and you'll see why that, that's useful in a second. All right, it executed and here's what happens. So this C SQL with values property um, shows the values filled in in place of the parameters. This isn't the SQL statement that was sent. It did send a parameterized query, but it is showing it with values, which for logging purposes is really useful because now I don't have to go and figure out, well, what was the value of this variable at the time that I executed this query? It's shown there right there um, in, in that statement. And there's our results. Now let's issue the same one, but now we'll use the typical question mark syntax. And this time it works, it'll work just fine. It's just that we, you know, we don't see those values in that, in that SQL values um, statement. There's our results. All right, so now let's take this Visual Fox Pro. I took a Visual Fox Pro um, 
SQL statement, just added text and end text around it. And then I set the L convert VFP syntax to true and then called execute SQL on it. And so even though this is not a valid SQL server statement, here's what it got converted to and it works just fine. Let's go and create a empty cursor from our customers table. That's what this method does. Let's go and add a record to that cursor and let's call the save data method to write that new record out to our customers table. So you notice I don't have to create my own insert into statement. I just call save data and it takes care of the work for me. Let's issue another SQL statement and show that the record was added. There's that record we just added right there. Now let's go and um, change. Let's go and find that record. Let's change the name of the company in our cursor. And then let's call save data to write that cursor back out to the database. Again, I don't have to worry about creating an update statement. It'll take care of it for me. Now let's go and call get record by ID to go and get that value, that, that, that record by ID. And you can see that it changed the company name to add the word ink at the end. And finally, let's delete the customer. So I'm going to call delete record and it's deleted. And then here, and then, oops, and here is the results. And last thing to show you, and we're done. And that is the SQL log. And here is what it looks like. So it has the date, the name of the user, what module was executing, the, what line number, if it's available, how long it took, how many records were returned, what the SQL statement was, whether an error occurred, and a hash of the, val of the result set, which is useful. For example, these three have the same hash value, which they should because it was the same query. If for some reason I had a different hash value, I'd have to look at my query and see what, you know, what went on there. All right, so I am out of time. So to wind up, accessing remote databases using Visual Fox Pro is simple, right? You call SQL string connect or SQL connect, you call, use SQL exec, you use SQL disconnect. But as we saw with this pretty deep dive and the white paper dives even deeper, there's a lot more to, to that. And I recommend that you use classes to manage your connections. Um, I won't take questions now because we're out of time, but I will pop over right away to the Q&A room. So feel free to join me there and we'll ask for questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate your, your attendance. Thank you.